Bill Vigue of Meet of the Word Ministries, and you are watching Let Us Go On. I want to talk to you today about prayers that reveal God's will to you. Uh, I've been in the ministry for over 37 years now, and uh, I, one of the first things that I really learned was that I could know God's will. Up before that, I was, I was 25 before I realized that you could know God's will. I had always thought you could never know God's will, and as a result, I never even tried to do God's will. And I now remember and know what Jesus had said, not everybody that comes to me shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but they that do the will of my Father who is in heaven. And uh, that kind of shocked me when I was a brand new Christian because I had always heard Christians being told from the pulpit now that you can never know what God will do. And they never really qualified it. They'd always just say, you know, God could just do something, you know, providential. Of course he can. Spontaneous. And of course he can. But it left the impression on so many Christians that they could not know God's will. When you tell somebody, you never know what God will do, well, that, that's a hindrance if you don't clarify that. So yes, we want to understand that God can do anything he wants whenever he wants according to his will, but we also need to know that what he said to us in his word, what's written down by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, all that Jesus taught because he was the word of God made manifest, it, it is God's will. That word, what God said is his will. He will not be inconsistent with what he has written. He won't don't say I love you, but then I'm going to hate you. Uh, and he'll hate the sin, but and they that he loves, he will, uh, you know, he'll chasten. Yes, but he loves us. There's uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That's how much he he loves us. So prayers that reveal God's will to you. And the prayer I want to deal with here today is uh, in the first chapter of the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in, in Ephesus. And I want to qualify it first by telling you a little bit about this particular city in Asia. It was at the end of uh, the Apostle Paul's second missionary journey that he came to Ephesus with two of his friends, Priscilla and Aquila, and there he went into the synagogue and he preached. And he had such a powerful effect upon the people that they begged him, longed for him to stay with them. But he was already on his way to Jerusalem and he told them, I must go to Jerusalem and keep this feast, but I will return to you if God wills. I will return because of the enthusiasm that they had. And then he left Ephesus and he sailed and he went back to Jerusalem, went to the church, uh, met with the brethren, and we don't know much more about that meeting when he went to Israel, uh, into Jerusalem, but it was for a celebration of one of the feasts, uh, probably the Feast of Passover, which was reflective of you know, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul sensed that he had to be there, and, and the people wanted him to stay in Ephesus, but he didn't. He moved on to Jerusalem and would return later. Now, at that time, Aquila and Priscilla remained in, in Ephesus, and another great man of God, a prophet by the name of Apollos, he came to the city of Jesus, and he was mighty in the scriptures, he was eloquent, he was a powerful, powerful man of God, and yet the scripture tells us that he only knew the baptism of John. He did not know the greater baptism, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so when Priscilla and Aquila, two teammates of the Apostle Paul, recognized that he did not know anything about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they took him under them and they expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Now thank God for water baptism, but there is another baptism. Even John the Baptist said, he has a baptism that I cannot possibly give you. And it was greater than John the Baptist, and it was the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the endowment of power, miraculous ability to communicate with God, to hear God's voice better, uh, for the anointing of God to flow through you in greater power and greater significance and greater boldness in witnessing and testifying for the Lord. So Apollos uh, ministered there, and then he left and went to Corinth, I believe it was. And then it says that Paul returned, and when he returned, the Bible says that God did special miracles through the hands of Paul. And they would take garments and handkerchiefs, put them on his body, and then the people would take them and they'd go into the cities and the villages and, and the highways and the byways and they'd apply those cloths to people that were sick, some death doomed, and people would miraculously recover. There was healing, that, that a tangible anointing that went from the Apostle Paul, a special miracle that God did, but he did it through his servants. 
servant, the Apostle Paul. And the effect was so great that it says all of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Great revival, probably the greatest revival of that, of that century, along with the revival that took place on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. But now this revival was going into the, into the heathen lands, going into the Gentiles and ministering very effectively. And then also one other reference I want to uh, mention um, 42 years later, after the Apostle Paul wrote the letter that we're going to read a portion of today, uh, 42 years later, Jesus sent a message to the church, the believers that were still in, in Ephesus, and he did it through, sent an angel, gave it to John, and, gave, and said, speak to these seven churches, and one of those seven churches was the church in Ephesus. And he pointed out five things that he really appreciated, that they were consistent with, with all of their lives. And he said, I know your works their works were notable. Their works were important. He liked their works. He appreciated the things he was do they were doing for God, working for God. He also said, I know your labor. He, know that, he knew that there's labor. Sometimes it's, it just not, doesn't just happen easy sometimes to be a faithful witness to Christ and be a strong Christian. They had to labor at it. He also said, I know your patience. And then he also he said, I know that you cannot bear that th those that are evil. They, they, like him, hated evil. And then fifth, they tried false apostles and found out that they were liars. They judged these people that would come in and claim that they were apostles of the Lord, and they proved them out. They tried them. They examined what they were saying in the light of the word of God and, and the scriptures, and with, obviously, the help of the Holy Spirit, they followed the instructions to prove all things, to judge those things, consider those things, and he, they found out and they proved out that these false apostles were actually liars. We've got a lot of liars in our society today, not just in the political system, but even from the pulpit sometime. And uh, again, if, if you're one of those uh, people that are in a church that are be being told that you can never know God's will, you might want to find another church. And if you're a pastor, and I'm saying this in love, if you're a minister, you're a pulpit minister, and you've been saying that and teaching that, Matt, might I suggest that you take a sabbatical and take some time to really study the Word of God because you want to provide the whole counsel of God for your people, not just a little bit of the truth. People need to know God's will, and they can't know God's will if we don't teach them God's will, and if they don't know God's will, how can they do the will of their Heavenly Father? How can we do it? Again, Jesus said, not everyone that calls upon me will be uh, enter into heaven, but they that do the will of my Father. We want to know the will of God, and that's why I want to deal with this prayer of the Apostle Paul, prayers that reveal God's will for you. You should be convinced after hearing what the Apostle Paul said under and wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that it is God's will for you. And this is only one little small portion today of so many of the wonderful prayers, especially the New Testament prayers that reveal God's will to you. God wants you to know his will so that you can do his will. So, oh, the one problem that the church in Ephesus had 42 years later was he said, but you have forgotten or you've lost your or fallen from your first love. And he called them to repent of that. Now, we don't know exactly what, I don't know anyways. You know, I've, we've heard a lot of different things. Maybe it's their relationship with God or maybe prayer and intimacy that they've kind of fallen away from. Maybe it's just forsaking the great commission to evangelize, to go into all the world that they seem to love. It could have been them, that, or all of those things. But he did recognize that they had departed or left their first love. And so the very first thing that happens to you when you're born again, whatever it is, don't lose it. Don't let it go. Don't let it slip. Hold on to it. Work at it. Labor at it. Study the Word of God. Refresh yourself with the Word of God so that you can make a difference, so that you can be an impact in society to those that have ears to hear and those that will listen to you. Now, Ephesians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul writes, and again, what we're about to read tells us that this church, the body of believers in Ephesus, was one of the best churches of that first century. I mean, they had significant revelation and insight. That means that they had ears to hear. They were, they were taught. They were learned, 
learned. They, want, they hungered and thirst for the things of God, and as a result, God gave them an abundance of revelation and insight into his will. But Paul writes, and he says here in verse 3, chapter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now let me break that statement up for a few moments, three, verses 3 and 4. He calls upon us to understand that God is blessed, he's our father, and he's the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now this tells us first that God's most considerable, uh, you know, cons most desired blessings upon us are spiritual blessings. Now that doesn't mean that God doesn't care about us on this earth and the natural blessings. God wants to bless us here. We need to understand that. God will bless us here. Uh, there's nothing wrong with having, having blessing, material blessing, wealth. Uh, it, it's fine as long as you understand that there's a spiritual blessing that's greater. You must understand all spiritual blessings, leaving nothing out. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. God has already given that to us. He's blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Where? In, in the heavens. And why and how? Because we're in Christ. Now what Paul will explain here in this letter is that just as Jesus is the head of the church, we, the members of the body of Christ, we are, 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 are his body on the earth. But we are with him in heavenly places. Christ is at, in the heavens right now and we are in his body. And so while he, the head of the church, is up there, he's using us spiritually. We are connected to him, but we're still down here on this earth being used by God through the flow of the Holy Spirit. And of course, through grace and truth, making sure that we survive and we can't, I mean, unmerited favor is grace, but also truth. God said, my word is truth. So he's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And then he says in verse 4, let me read it again, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, many people, many Christians have been misled by this. And actually, the implication in many churches today is that, uh, that this is saying that God has chosen you and I or anybody that's saved before the foundation of the world to be saved. And then other people that are not saved and, and are going to die in their sin where they were chosen by God before the foundation of the world to die. But what Paul is getting to here is going right back to Genesis chapter 1. Before God created man on the sixth day, he prepared the earth for man over those first five days. And then he created man. Now, so before the foundation of the world, God had chosen us. Before the foundation, he has chosen us to be in him. That, and here's what he chose us to do, or here's what we were predestined to do, or let's say it this way, here is what mankind was destined to do. This was the will of God for Adam and Eve and all of their seed. They didn't accomplish it because they disobeyed God, and the entirety of, of the seed of man were spoiled and even depraved until Jesus came on the scene, the second Adam, and when he came on the scene, and men called upon him and appreciated his body broken for them, and appreciated the blood shed for them, and they receive him, and they're born again and saved, then all of a sudden, the work of God begins to develop. But here's what God had chosen before the foundation of the world for mankind, for you and I that are Christians, but really all those that might come to the Lord. And that is this, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That's what he predestined us. That's what he chose for us when he first created man, that we would be holy and that we would be without blame. Adam and Eve lost holiness, and they were guilty. They lost that without blame aspect. And so God had to regenerate mankind through the promise of a Messiah, through the promise of one that would come and has come for you and I today. Verse 5, he says, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. It is God's good pleasure to adopt us, 
to bring us back into the kingdom of God. All those that were depraved, were lost in our sins, he chose. He, had, he made a way, and he predestined that way. Sovereignly predestined. He can't change that. He is sovereign. He will not change the destiny of man. This is what God wants for you and I. It is God's will for you to be saved, to be adopted as children, to be one of the sons of God. Verse 8, it says, wherein he has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Now, I love that wisdom and prudence. Obviously, prudence is, involves with being careful in your thought life, careful, reasonable, listening uh, diligently to the things of God, and, and, and therefore knowing what God's will is. But he also says, in all wisdom, in all wisdom. Knowledge is one thing. To, to know something is very important. To know God's will is very important. But wisdom is the ability to act upon what you know. There are many people that are highly educated, went to college for eight years, you know, or high honors in high school, and today they're driving a truck. Or they're, you know, nothing wrong with driving a truck. I should never even deal with that because that's, you know, white collar, blue collar, God loves us all equally, fairly. But the point I'm trying to make is they had knowledge their college education gave them knowledge, but they didn't have the wisdom. They did not have the skill to apply that knowledge, to do that knowledge. And that's what wisdom is all about. It is being able to apply what you know. Now, he says this again, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. God has made known to us. Now, there are people that are not yet born-again Christians. They don't know the mystery of God's will. It's still a mystery to them. But when you are born again, when you enter into the kingdom of God, and especially when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit and you're endued with power from on high, the, the miraculous ability that is given to you is also to know the mysteries of his will. Again, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. And the mystery of his will is the word of God revealed to us. That is the safest, soundest way to know God's will is to highly esteem the scriptures. Now, you say, well, I'm, I'm being taught by the Holy, Holy Ghost. Well, the Holy Ghost will teach you according to the scriptures. And the Holy Ghost will witness to you what the scriptures or what the truth has to say. But you are, you're going to have to do the same thing with the spirit that might be operating around you, a spirit, uh, spirits in the world uh, that are operating in trying to deceive you and lie to you, like those false prophets that the Ephesians you know, tried and proved and found out that they were liars. They were, were not telling the truth. So he says, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. God wants us to know his will. He does not want it to remain a mystery to you. He wants you to know his will. It's a mystery to those that are without. But those that are in Christ Jesus, it is not a mystery. It is his will revealed to you. Now, verse 15, it says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love unto all the saints, I do not cease to pray for you or do two things for you. Now, here is where I want to break it down. Uh, the prayer, uh, one of the prayers that reveals the will of God to you. Paul prayed this prayer for those in Ephesus. Apparently, they needed that prayer. He wouldn't pray for them if they automatically had it. There's a lot of people today that just think that all you need to do is get saved, get born again, and then you don't have to worry about anything else. You don't have to pray. But Paul obviously understood he needed to pray. He wanted to pray. He understood the necessity of praying these specific things so that they would manifest or they would work in, his, in their lives. And so he says, I do not cease to pray for you these two things. First was to give thanks for you, and second, making mention of you in my prayers. Now, one of the, well, let me, let me just uh, say this. Earnestly consider what Paul specifically prayed for them or for us to receive. Again, you don't have it automatically. I don't have it automatically. And we don't have it manifesting in its fullness. It's potentially inside of us because the Holy Spirit is there. And the Holy Spirit can manifest through us as he wills, according to his will, and any time throughout any saint. I mean, if he, can, if he can speak through a donkey in the Old Testament, he can certainly manifest the gifts of the Holy Spirit in every saint. But not every saint is... is uh, and let me say, uh, featured or, or has each of those gifts in, in their possession or operating in, in such a 
you know, a strong way. Sometimes it, we have some gifts are a little bit stronger in us. But again, potentially, you might not pray and speak in tongues yet, but the potential of you speaking to God in tongues is there. You may never have seen the working of miracles, but the potential of working of miracles resides on the inside of you. If you press into the things of God, if you seek God, if you earnestly want something from God enough, if you, the Bible says, uh, if we diligently seek him, he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He wants us to have faith in him. So the more diligent you are in seeking out God, the more manifestation of the Holy Spirit or endowment of his Holy Spirit power, the anointing, will work through you, will work through us. Now, you might not have that gift all the time, but it can work through you. The potential is there. Again, the intimacy with God and the prayer life with God is important. So again, consider earnestly what Paul prays. He says here, first off, that, that he, and he says, I pray for you this, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Now, let's break that down for a moment. Uh, you think for a moment in the Old Testament, there was Solomon. Solomon was the wisest man in all the world. He had sought God for wisdom, and God gave him wisdom, and as a result, he just produced a magnificent kingdom that all these other kings and leaders of the world in his day came to see him, but he lost it. Eventually, he violated certain things and he went in the wrong direction for a terrible season. Yeah, he was saved, but he lost his reward. And in a way, he lost his kingdom. He did not continue with the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. John the Baptist, Jesus said, was the, uh, among men was the greatest of all prophets. And he lived out there in the wilderness eating wild uh, locusts and honey. And, um, and Jesus highlighted him as a magnificent prophet of God. So you can't weigh, you can't weigh spirituality between you, know, you being the wealthiest or being the poorest of the poor, wandering out in the wilderness, having no place, no, no bed to lie down on. You, can't, you cannot judge people based upon that. That's not the sign of spirituality. And that's why Paul prays this prayer, and I want to repeat it again. The first thing he prays for them, I cease not to pray for you, giving thanks and making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord, Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and the revelation in the knowledge of him. God wants you to know him. He wants you to have the knowledge of him. But secondly, he wants you to have the spirit of wisdom. Now, again, going back to he's blessed us with all spiritual uh, blessings. Well, one of the chief blessings of all, particularly spiritually speaking, is wisdom. This is not referring to the wisdom of men or the wisdom of intellectuals. This is talking about the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of wisdom. He want, and, and, and I know exactly what, what he's talking about because I've had that happen. And you can have this happen to you. Matter of fact, you can pray this prayer for you or you can pray this prayer just as Paul prayed for other people. Many times I've prayed for other people or even for myself by saying, Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I ask that you would give me a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and your will. You can pray that for yourself. You can pray that for your wife. You can pray that for your children. You can pray that. This is God's will revealed to you. He wants you to have that spirit of wisdom, and he wants you to have the revelation in the knowledge of him. Then the next thing he says, I pray for you that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, and that you may know what is the hope of his calling. So God wants you to know two things, three things here. He wants you to understand. When he, when he says the eyes of your understanding, he's not talking about your visual eyes. He wants the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened. He wants you to understand him. He wants you to know him, and he wants you to have wisdom in how to apply that knowledge and that understanding. And then he says again, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Do you as a Christian know what he hopes of you? Do you understand he has high hopes for you? Do you understand he cares deeply for your effectiveness in this world, in this life, in that breath that you take? Not just so that you can be blessed in your world, but that you can be a blessing. That's the purpose of breathing it all out. He wants you to know the hope of his calling. Then he wants us also, he said, I pray that... Um, 
that you would know what is the, uh, the riches of the glory of his inheritance that is committed to the saints. There are riches, and it's not just material riches. There's wealth in the realm of the spirit. There's wealth in the glory of God. And there's great wealth in the inheritance that's destined for you and I who are saints. Now, if you're not a Christian, you can surrender your heart to Jesus Christ at any moment, and you can begin to have God access those things, unlock the door, open the door, and let these things come in. He also wanted, prayed that for them, wanting them, this again is the will of God, that you would know what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe, not to the unbeliever. And when I talk about when it says unto us that believe, there's a lot of us in the kingdom of God that don't believe everything that God's word said yet. And so he wants you to know the exceeding greatness of his power. And then uh, when did all this get accomplished? He says in verse 20, which is wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and then secondly set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Let's not forget that Jesus didn't accomplish everything at the cross while some people just think at the cross it was all done, it was all finished. Jesus said, it is finished. No, his life was finished. His breath was sucked out of him. He was dead in the flesh, but his ministry and his work for God was not finished. He also had to be raised from the dead, and then he had to be set at the right hand of the Father. And what's he doing there? I say it all the time. If you watch this program, you probably heard it. He's ever living to make intercession for the saints. And why is that? Because we need his prayers. We need his intercessions, even today. He prays that we would know, understand, and have the wisdom of all these things. Ephesians verse 21 says, uh, and Jesus is raised not only from the dead, but he is raised far above all principality and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, the millennial reign and then the eternal state that he's talking about. So Jesus and the name of Jesus is set above all all things, and every knee will bow to the name of Jesus. Everything will bow, will surrender to the name of Jesus. Again, he is set far above all principality. That's all the angelic hosts, the good and the bad, all the evil, all powers, all powers of any saint or any angel, all uh, might, all strength, all dominion, everything that is named, not only in this world, but in that which is to come. And then he says, and he has put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. That's you and I. So we know he's the head of us, the church, the body of believers on the earth right now. But he also wants us to understand which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all things. To have all things put under his feet mean all those things are under our feet because we're the body of Christ. Everything should bow down to you and I. I mean, even the weather should, should, can, can be subject to change through our faith in God and through the power. God has released that kind of power. You have significance in this world, but you've got to understand it. You've got to come to know it, and you've got to learn how to apply it. I pray for you and ask that God be a blessing in this week for you. You have a wonderful, wonderful day. God bless you.